Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's my pleasure here to be at an MIMS and talk to you a little bit about the AI conundrum. Now, the word conundrum is an interesting one because it talks about two opposing thoughts existing at one point in time. And I feel artificial intelligence today has that similar kind of conundrum in all of our heads. At one end, we have this feeling whenever we think about AI, right? Excited as a child for his next ice cream. We are excited about the potential of driverless cars. We are excited about uh, being, uh, talking to customer service agents, which are chatbots, which can actually solve problems rather than put us on hold. We are really excited as a customer. And my company, Fluid AI, is taking this excitement to the next level in fields like banking as well as in media. So let me show you one quick demo, Tejas, if you can set that up, uh, about the future of banking using AI. So banking traditionally has been something that we've associated with something boring, going to a bank branch, standing in a line. But my company says, hey, can we reinvent this experience to be something different, to be something new age? And this is what we have come up with. So it's an AI avatar on the screen. Now let me just walk in front of her. She's reading a book Hi, right Hi, and now. welcome to the branch of the future powered by artificial intelligence from Fluid AI. So as soon as she saw me, she left her book. She said, hi, welcoming me in. Let's say I'm a new customer of this bank. You can now sign up for a new card, explore MasterCard products, tell us what you think about us, log a query, or even talk to an advisor. So let me go ahead and say, let me check out a few products of this bank. Loans or cards, I'm we offer the cards. Card. Using plastic money is my... She's putting this hey, so I noticed you shop online a lot. We have a special cashback card for e-commerce that gives you 2% cashback every time you shop. Would you like to check it out? So she's put me in the background. She's Hover your hand over the interested button and I can have one of our specialists get in touch with you. She interrupts me quite a bit, but she's put me in the background of this safe. She's talking to me about this new card Hi, looking at my transaction event. And branch of the and future from there, powered I can go by ahead artificial and actually have a transaction. You can now card. sign up for a new card. And here, let's say I want get to get your card, get card in an instant. Just hold so on a moment. Let me front. take a quick passport size picture of you. And I'm saying, okay, let me show it some national ID I have right now. Can and from there, from that national ID, she can actually go ahead and Hi. give me a credit card instantly. So that is the power of our AI platform today to get you an instant credit card, to know what kind of credit card you would be interested in, and to move forward from there and actually create a transaction. Now, this is what excites a consumer, right? This is what excites you guys about AI, about what is the potential of this technology in the future. Now, let's take that paradigm, and since we're in Teaching Institute, to the paradigm of education. Let's say you want to learn finance today. Now, who would you want to learn finance from? I would say a lot of you in the audience maybe today want to learn finance from Warren Buffett. Our company made that possible when we launched the first AI cover for Forbes magazine at the 100th anniversary, where Warren Buffett could talk to each and every one of you. And the experience looks something like this. I say, I looked at this and I said, what does this mean? First ever AI cover. What does that mean? Well, Warren worked closely with us and a company called Fluid AI. You take a picture of that cover, an, a three-dimensional image, uh, holograph of uh, Warren pops up, and he'll answer questions. So the number one question that Warren was asked was, Hi, I'm Warren Buffett, and we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of Forbes magazine by answering your questions. Thanks to artificial intelligence, you and I can have a conversation. So ask away. This was the number one question. Invest in yourself. You can't beat it. I see people. All right, and you could have the, much the deeper conversations with Warren, but what we really found interesting about this paradigm was that you're no longer limited by what the journalist once spoke to Warren. You have your own imagination. He's right there in front of you, physically available. And it's really exciting, right? Imagine being a student and saying, hey, I don't want to particularly learn about this concept in this manner. I want to ask my own questions and get my answers and actually having that conversation with the digital media. But when we talk about this conundrum, so that's the exciting part. But there's also the part that creates a bit of terror in us, right? Will our jobs exist tomorrow? Will our companies exist tomorrow? Will all of it just be automated away? And frankly, as an entrepreneur, 
as an employee, as a student, it is a scary future when you look at it that way. But I'm here to put your mind at ease. They have a joke that said that when scientists made the first truly artificial intelligence system, they asked it a question. And the question they asked that system was, is there a god? And the answer they got back was, well, there is now. So there's sometimes when you feel about AI, you feel that you know, it's going to be Skynet, it's going to be like the Matrix. But I'm here to tell you, don't worry, be happy. If you look at AI through these three lenses, which I'll share with you. The very first lens I want to talk to you about is a very simple lens, the lens of adaption. Human beings have adapted to changes since time immemorial. AI is just another adaption in the way we go forward. If you see that, that's a bank branch from somewhere in the mid-90s. You can see a row of tellers, all of them handing out cash, taking in cash, right? And bank tellers were a huge and important part of the banking system. A bank was seen as a place where you put in cash, take out cash, and that's what a bank teller did. In the 1980s, they came up with these things, ATMs. And they said, hey, the bank teller job is going to be destroyed, right? Because these guys work 24-7. They are fully automated. They can give you cash when you want it. Why would you go to a bank teller? But if you look at the US, US Bureau of Labor Statistics, the bank teller job expanded from 300,000 people being employed as bank tellers in the 70s to 600,000 people being employed as bank tellers in 2000. Now, why did that happen? The bank teller job itself changed. While the cash went to these machines, the bank teller became your financial advisor. He became your wealth advisor. He became your financial support and, into, and your link to the bank. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what AI is going to enable. It's not going to take away jobs. It's going to enable human beings to move from pencil pushing, to move from day-to-day -day normal tasks to higher level tasks, to tasks which we enjoy, to more analytical tasks. And that's going to be a really interesting future. And it's happened before, right? It's happened in the ATM industry. It's going to happen again and again. So just like this chameleon on the screen changes its color, that's how human beings are continuously going to adapt and change their color depending on how AI fills in the gaps. So what's going to be in fashion? A lot of people ask me, they say, they say hey, Raghav, if AI is going to take over all the general stuff, all the day-to-day -day stuff, what's going to be interesting? And I say, if you look at three key areas of human endeavor, these are going to be really difficult for AI to handle. And this is where the value lies in the future. It's going to be in creativity, obviously. For a long time, AI is going to be challenged to be creative. It's going to be in empathy. Anything that involves empathy, emotion, relation, is going to be in the realm of humans for fairly long periods of time. And finally, eventually, when there are enough AI systems, they're all going to give you output. They're all going to say, I think this is optimal. I think this is right for you. You then have to be the macro decision maker of your life to say, hey, you know, even if there are conflicting inputs, I can make these decisions on my own. So these are the three places where human endeavor stays stable and great uh, away from the AI's um, purview. Now I'm going to put up some logos on the screen. Uh, PBR Cinemas, General Motors, India Post, Marriott, Walmart. And this is my second lens. I'm talking about the lens of structure. When we look at the world today, we look at all these companies, we say, hey, General Motors for autom uh, automotives. We look at PBR for entertainment. We look at Marriott for hotels. And we look at these large corporations and say, wow, they employ hundreds and thousands of people. They uh, gain full employment all across countries, maybe across the world itself. And it's really interesting. But what are they getting replaced by in the new structure is PBR gets replaced by Netflix. You have a General Motors getting replaced by Uber. You have India Post by WhatsApp. You have Air Marriott by Airbnb. And you have Walmart by Amazon. Now, all of these companies are much smaller. Uber employs maybe a few thousand people compared to the millions General Motors employed at its height. Airbnb is, again, a few thousand in San Francisco vis-a-vis -vis Marriott, which is hundreds and thousands of people across the world. But what we've got to fundamentally understand is that this structure is not about less employment. All of these are platforms. Uber has millions of drivers who are entrepreneurs for themselves. Airbnb has allowed 
millions of homeowners to become hoteliers in different countries. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the new structure of the AI economy as well. For an entrepreneur in the old environment, it was all about hiring staff, creating huge teams, right? You had an admin person, you had sales teams, you had legal teams, you had HR teams, you had accountants. The new entrepreneur of the future is going to be a short founding team powered by an AI brain. You want a, an agreement with your customer, there's an AI contract analysis for that. You want to have sales discussions with millions of customers at scale, put chatbots on your website, put our avatars to talk to them. You want to do automated accounting, you want to keep up with the latest tax laws, there's an AI that can understand tax rules and do your accounting for you. What AI is going to fundamentally do, ladies and gentlemen, is going to create entrepreneurs out of all of us. We are going to have much more entrepreneurship in the economy. We are going to be much more in control. So if you look at it from this lens of structure, you're going to see smaller companies, nimbler companies, but you're going to see much more of them. So again, there's no real need to be worried that saying, oh, there's no longer a General Motors, because there may be a time and place where each person owns his own automotive company and is making decisions of where to send it. And finally is the leisure paradox. If you look at the 18th century, this was the paradigm of work. 12 hours a day, six days a week. And people said, hey, that's the way normal human life goes. You get one day off. This is the modern knowledge worker. Eight hours a day, five days a week. There is no, no absolute time period that human beings need to work for. If that leisure period increases, there really is no fear. There really is no need for us to expand ourselves on work. In fact, if you ask any person today in the audience, they'll say, hey, I work too much. And then if we look at AI and say, hey, if that can take up more and more of the day-to-day -day tasks, more and more of our time goes to leisure and creative activities, why not? Now, the question that comes back is, but if I'm going to work for lesser hours, am I going to earn less? That, ladies and gentlemen, is not true. Because wherever human activity and endeavor is valued, you will still earn that much only for it. Because wherever empathy is required, wherever creativity is required, there will still be that value attached to it, which AI cannot replace. So maybe in the future, when you look back at me and this conversation, you have a five-hour workday, four days a week, and it's all not that bad. So there are three lenses that I talked to you about from the AI perspective, where I said, hey, it's all about adaptability. It's all about the changing structure. And it's all about appreciating that more leisure in our lives is not necessarily a bad thing. So when I come to it, what are the three tips that I think that we need to take, take forward when we look at AI as a whole? The very first thing is flexibility is the key. Because as more and more time goes forward, we will need to be more and more flexible to adapt to the changes that AI brings to our world. So whether it be saying, hey, I may need to reskill, relearn, that's going to happen all the time. But when you just say about flexibility, I think the important part is Focus on the humanness in your flexibility. Focus on areas of creativity. Focus on areas of empathy where you, as a human, can truly add value vis-a-vis -vis the day-to-day, -day, uh, the routine, the mathematical, the structured. I think the second interesting tip that I'll say is, is from the decision-making uh, aspect. What's going to happen in the future is you're going to have a lot of AIs who are going to push decisions to you. It's like Netflix, right? When you go to Netflix, there's an AI at the back end that's recommending the right movie for you. But if you have skepticism of that decision, you may actually improve your experience. Because unless we really go to the heart of the decision that the AI is pushing to us, unless we sometimes at least question it, you're going to go in a place and say, hey, this path is already charted out for me. You will have less and less autonomy because the AI systems will recommend more and more. So what I say is learn the macro decision making, combine it with healthy skepticism so that you make decisions which are not all algorithmic, but which are actually controlled by you. The final piece is, and I think something that we are all struggling with, is responsible leisure. As your leisure periods increase, as a human race, our time spent doing not productive work, but just enjoying ourselves or being creative increases, it's up to us to enjoy that leisure, but be uh, responsible while enjoying it. Lesser screen time, lesser gaming, l more in integration with nature and just the overall environment is something that I feel is going to be important in the future. Because finally, ladies and gentlemen, any AI system can game you. It can actually say, hey, this is Raghav. He, if I send him a notification at 7 AM, he's going to check it. 
So we need to be careful that when we talk about leisure systems, when we talk about how we spend our time in our leisure time, we ensure that it is something that we do that we truly enjoy, maybe building connections with our family, maybe building connections with the environment, but something that is truly different rather than being gamed by an AI system. Ladies and gentlemen, you are a wonderful audience. Thank you so much.